Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this 10th lecture. Today we are having it in the afternoon, uh, simply because of change of program. And uh, if you recall, uh, this is uh, one of the lectures in our series uh, of the philosophy of science in economics. Uh, right now you are aware that um, we have uh, covered a number of things that take us into uh, the deeper, deeper waters of uh, philosophy of economics and uh, I think very soon uh, we'll be moving towards uh, the uh, conclusion of our course uh, but um, uh, right now we are on lecture 10. Uh, I have been giving you books to read uh, and I hope you've been reading those books um, and I will not really uh, tell you what these books are because in our lecture six, actually lecture seven, I told you the books you should look out for, uh, lecture uh, eight, lecture nine and lecture ten and the books are the same. Now I will also uh, take this opportunity to remind you the kind of things that you've been uh, covering or been saying. Uh, the topic that we started, that uh, we are concluding in this lecture, uh, is the topic uh, on realism and anti-realism about economics. Remember, we are dealing with the philosopher of science in economics. If you recall in lecture seven, lecture eight and nine, I gave you an introduction uh, for realism and anti-realism about economics. I took you through to the scientific realism in a conventional philosophy of science. Uh, we continued and covered ingredients of a, a minimal scientific realism. Uh, we also went ahead and covered uh, common sensibles and their modifications in economic modeling. And under common sensibles, we covered uh, isolation by idealization. We actually had a discussion about that. Uh, we also had a discussion uh, which centered around Friedman's 1953 essay. Uh, we continued and had a discussion about ontology versus methodology, but more specifically dealing with closed systems. And then uh, we also uh, went a step further and discussed modeling invisible hand mechanisms. Uh, today, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, because we are uh, actually discussing the last part uh, of uh, our uh, realism and anti-realism philosophy. And that last part is social construction of reality in economics. And therefore, uh, in this uh, lecture, we shall attempt to discover uh, exactly uh, what, we what we socially construct. And uh, uh, that is very important. So we shall be looking at social construction of what? Uh, now, Two aspects shall be covered in this lecture. Uh, don't lose sight of that. One, we shall look at the rhetorical construction of the world and the truth, but from economics perspectives. Uh, and then uh, two, we shall look at performativity. That's from performance, performativity and the economics dependence of the economy. And thereafter, we shall close, or we, I'll give you a conclusion uh, of the discussion. So, join me, ladies and gentlemen, to get into this most interesting subject of social construction of reality in economics. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start by recognizing the fact that as economists in the 19th century understood so well, it follows from the open system character of the economy that A, theories and models 
are hard or impossible. And then two, we need to understand that to test conclusively by the predictive strength and implications of these models and theories is not a very simple thing. And in fact, when we follow the debate in the area of economics, we somehow appreciate this important and noble task of, no, of knowledge creation. It's not really a very simple thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say, and again starting from the works of uh, Friedman, uh, Milton. Now, Friedman exhibited awareness uh, of these issues that led to theorizing and modeling which are very hard and quite often impossible. So Friedman, uh, in his own emphasis on prediction as the goal and the criteria of theorizing, and in so doing particularly paying attention to its subjective and social aspects, did acknowledge the importance and the difficulties involved in theorizing and modeling economics, mechanisms, and forces, and uh, the behavioral aspect of economics. Ladies and gentlemen, in passages mostly neglected by commentators, uh, Friedman stresses the roles of subjective judgment Friedman certainly uh, stresses disciplinary tradition and institutions and the consensus among economists in shaping theory uh, and practice. Uh, so even in uh, theory choice, then you have to look at consensus among economists and the disciplinary tradition and institutions and the roles played by subjective judgments, ladies and gentlemen. So these statements that were made by Friedman uh, reinforce the admission that objectively decisive predictive tests are unavailable in economics, ladies and gentlemen. So you can't talk about an objectively decisive predictive tests or test. So these objectively decisive predictive tests are unavailable in economics, ladies and gentlemen. Now, in his works, Friedman uh, views uh, in what you'll find in his 1953 essay, Friedman says, that neither the evidence of the economist nor that of the sociologist is conclusive. Right, remember we are dealing with research, right? And we are trying to construct knowledge, but we quite often we face limitations. Now, the decisive test is whether the hypothesis works for the phenomenon it purports to explain. So you always talk about a hypothesis, you talk about a theory, you talk about a model, right? But the decisive test that you can uh, use at this material time for making judgment is to find out whether the hypothesis works for the phenomenon it purports to explain. But a judgment may be required before any satisfactory test of this kind has been made. And uh, perhaps when it can't be made in the near future, in which case the judgment will have to be based on the inadequate, inadequate evidence available. So it's very hard to get sufficient evidence and to begin dealing with uh, a construction of that particular reality. So in addition, ladies and gentlemen, when a test can be made, the background of the scientist is not irrelevant.
to the judgment they reach. So we all come with lenses in research and we come from different perspectives. I hope you still remember the, uh, the, the lecture that we went through uh, some time back. I think this must have happened around lecture four, uh, lecture three and lecture four, constructing the world. That's the time when we look at the scrutability theorem, uh, which was taken from Laplace, right? Uh, where you have that intellect that is so fast, uh, that is so vast, and you have a lot of information about uh, every event and every phenomenon, and then at the end of the day, you must be able to use that information to infer what is likely to happen in future. So, whenever we are confronted with situations that require an explanation or explanations, ladies and gentlemen, the background of the scientists is not irrelevant to the judgments that they reach. You need also to remember that there is never certainty in science and the weight of evidence for or against a hypothesis can never be assessed completely objectively. So we try to bring in objectivity. Unfortunately, bias and biases will always crop in in our um, uh, research and, of course, the philosophical stance that we take. And uh, do not forget uh, that uh, in the research, in the process of constructing knowledge, that we need to look at ontology, we need to look at epistemology, we need to look at axiology, we need to look at methodology and methods. Now, the issue that brings in objectivity is that element that comes in at the axiological level, the values, uh, the objectivity and the biases that we bring into the research process, ladies and gentlemen. So there's no way you can do away with that element, right? Because it is always there. So certainty cannot be achieved 100% in science. And uh, the weight of evidence, uh, either for or against a particular hypothesis, can never be assessed completely, objectively, ladies and gentlemen. Therefore, the economist will be more tolerant than the sociologist in judging conformity of the implication of the hypothesis with experiences. He will be persuaded to accept the hypothesis tentatively by fewer instances uh, of conformity. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, therefore, so complete objectivity, this thing that we call complete, complete objectivity in testing a theory is unattainable. It is unattainable since the judgment and persuasions that are involved and these are shaped by the background of the scientist and the degree of tolerance characteristic of a disciplinary culture, ladies and gentlemen. So when we go back to the works of Friedman, uh, especially Friedman's views in 1953 essay, we find that his views were connected backwards uh, to the 19th century realist tradition, although some people have dismissed him as anti-realist, right? But um, his views can be connected to the 19th century realist tradition as well as forward to later Kuhnian and social constructivist ideas about science. I'm sure you have read The Structure of Scientific Revolution by Kuhn. And remember, Friedman comes in 1953. Uh, that's when he writes uh, his essay, and Kuhn 
uh, does his work in the 1960s. So, ladies and gentlemen, social constructivism is usually considered uh, an anti-realist idea. Again, it depends on uh, uh, the fence uh, where you are in terms of the discussion or a conversation uh, because not everybody actually agrees to this and in your case if you are going to advance an argument and the discussion you should always have these authorities uh, at the back of your mind so again things are more complex and not always uh, quite as they might first appear. So the complexity of the discipline and of course the background of the researcher, the lenses or the lens that the fellow carries and certainly the objectivity that the fellow brings into the research process can help you articulate these issues very well and therefore at this level we have to ask questions uh, so we must then ask how much and what kind of social construction can realism accommodate uh, so ladies and gentlemen economics has been claimed to be rhetorical and performative and those are the two concepts that we are going to discuss in social construction of reality especially relating to the philosophy of economics so economics has been claimed to be rhetorical and performative with apparently anti-realist implications. And it is by discussing these claims that we can set out to answer the question. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's just pause a little bit. You know, once in a while I talk about economics as realist. At the same time, uh, during discussions I say, well, economics is anti-realist. Now, these views that I'm presenting to you are a reflection of the debates in economic literature. Some scholars believe that economics is realist. Others believe it is anti-realist. It's up to you to take a position on these things, depending on the amount of information available to you and the literature that you have read and the support that you have. Now, for me, I'm just thinking at this material time that when we are dealing with economics, we need to bring in a lot of realism. Uh, because, uh, as I said, most of the things we deal with in economics are not similar to the ones we see in the natural sciences of the physical sciences when you start talking about electrons. No, you are dealing with the behaviors and these things are very important. So, why don't we at this material time address the rhetorical construction of world or the world and the truth? So when do we say that economics uses rhetoric to construct the world and to convince others that what they are saying is the truth? Rhetoric. So the rhetorical aspect of economics started being highlighted in the emerging literature and the debate from the early 1980s onwards. So when you pick literature in the area of economics and research, uh, especially the literature written and published in the 1980s onwards, ladies and gentlemen, you will discover that the general idea of rhetoric is that in writing, in talking, people attempt to persuade their audiences by influencing the intensity of their beliefs. So there are those scholars who believe that economics is using rhetoric. So the way we write in economics, the way we talk in economics, we attempt, we as economists, attempt to persuade our audiences or our audience by influencing the intensity of their beliefs, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why the element of rhetoric has come up, especially in the 
80s, and therefore we need to understand that very well. So scientific writing and talking, ladies and gentlemen, is no exception and cannot be separated from rhetoric. So much of what scientists do is to try to persuade their various audiences. And here I'm talking about disciplinary audiences. So we try to persuade the disciplinary audiences. We try to influence their thinking. Uh, and here in this case, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you an example. We persuade colleagues in our own fields to accept us, to accept our views. We persuade students, we persuade administrators, we persuade funding agencies, we persuade political decision makers, we persuade law lay audiences. So whenever we have a point, we must communicate that point. So therefore, the issue of rhetoric comes in. And some scholars have argued that over the years, some of the things that have been put forward uh, by economists are probably, are probably unrealistic. But because of the forceful nature of economists, economists have managed to persuade the audiences to believe uh, that what they are saying is correct. And therefore, there is no error in what they are saying. So at that material time, or this material time, we are talking about rhetoric, ladies and gentlemen. We convince our disciplinary audiences to believe uh, what we are doing, and to even have faith in the models that we develop. So much of the literature on the rhetoric of economics has been preoccupied with the identification of various rhetorical ploys and the textual strategies used by economists in their attempts to persuade ladies and gentlemen. So those texts and rhetorical aspects include the use of metaphors, they also include the use of appeals, right? So when do we use metaphors, ladies and gentlemen? So these metaphors that are used, right, many of them have sources in physics and medicine. Uh, certainly you have to appreciate the fact that some of the things that are discussed in the area of economics uh, certainly have uh, relationships with what was discovered in the area of economics. So when you are talking about the theory of thermodynamics, for instance, and you also start talking about various concepts in economics, uh, you'll find some bit of similarities here and there. So economic, economists will wake up one morning and say, what we are saying has relevance because even in physics, this is what was discovered uh, during this time. So metaphors are used here uh, to relate to some of these things. So we also use appeals in economics. Uh, and here, these are appeals to academic authority, appeals to intuition, appeals to introspection, and exhibiting mathematical brilliance. So we use models, sophisticated mathematical models, uh, to actually convince our disciplinary audience that what we're doing is correct, right? So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, the rhetorical image of economics uh, entertained by, for instance, uh, uh, what we call Dardre, Makroske, and Ajo Klama has employed now a conversational model of rhetoric. So when you go back to the works of Deirdre, Makloske, and Ajo Klama, you'll find this uh, what you call conversational model of rhetoric. Uh, again, coming in to try and uh, convince the disciplinary uh, audience. Right. So, and of course, they argue, especially Agio Klammer and Makroske, that economics is conversation. They also uh, say that economics is persuasion, persuasion. And in this element of persuasion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the aspect 
facts that we are trying to put forward into a disciplinary audience uh, will take place within a conversation. So we try to persuade uh, through the conversations uh, we engage in. So Makroske again has enriched uh, this into the notion of what he calls uh, honest conversation by incorporating the idea of what he has called Spraskowski, right? Praskowski is uh, an important aspect and perspective here, uh, which is defined in terms of uh, uh, a number of principles, right? The Spraskowski is defined in terms of principles like, don't lie, pay attention, don't sneer, cooperate, don't shout, let other people talk, be open-minded, explain yourself when asked, don't resort to violence or conspiracy in aid of your ideas. And of course, that's what you find in the works of Makroski 1995 and Maki 2000. So that is the kind of thinking that has come to the fore right now. So on this image, right, uh, of economics, ladies and gentlemen, remember we are dealing with the rhetoric. Uh, whatever there is in the world and whatever is true about the world then become a result of rhetorical persuasion a variant of social construction. So rhetorical persuasion is a variant of social construction. And therefore, seen this way and in this perspective, truth is nothing but persuasiveness. So truth are not something to be discovered, right? But rather to be constructed by way of rhetorical efforts. So that is another aspect that has come to the fore and which needs to be uh, again uh, taken on uh, and what you say, head on in terms of our conversations. So this sort of anti-realism has been uh, marketed as part of the package of economics as rhetorical. So while beliefs can be manipulated by rhetoric, truth, ladies and gentlemen, cannot. And uh, we shall have a lecture on truth uh, so that we understand what truth is all about. So a realist rhetoric or rhetorical realism, ladies and gentlemen, is an option, right? So rhetoric is an important aspect uh, in the philosophy of science of economics in as far as realism is concerned, but more so the social construction of reality. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to move to the second aspect uh, of the social construction of reality and thereafter close. Now this second aspect that we have to discuss is referred to as performativity and the economics dependence of the economy. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, many central things in economics Right? As I said earlier on, don't exist mind independently. So we cannot talk about economics in terms of electrons. No. Many things do happen in our minds. Relationships, for instance, contracts, right? If you are talking about transaction costs at the end of the day, and you must really examine all these uh, transaction costs, then that aspect must come to the fore. So, for example, while in physics, you can, for example, give the structure of the atom in terms of its units. In physics, you can say an atom is the smallest unit of matter that retains all of the chemical properties of an element. You can also say that an atom consists of two regions. Uh, the first is the uh, tiny atomic nucleus, uh, which is in the center of the atom and contains positively charged particles called protons and neutral and uh, charged particles called neutrons. And you can also say the second is a much larger region of the atom 
uh, which certainly is a cloud of electrons, uh, negatively charged particles that orbit around the nucleus, right? In economics, you will not make the same statements, ladies and gentlemen. So while electrons and their kin exist, if they do, mind independently, many central things in the domain of economics don't. Their existence is essentially dependent on human minds, right? What about the idea of science independence in our minimal scientific realism? Right, those are questions we need to ask. Might the entities of economics, their properties and behavior exist economics independently? Or might they and the truth about them be dependent on economic theories and economists' beliefs, ladies and gentlemen? So I know that we have just discussed uh, these issues in relation to the rhetoric of economics. And that's where we started. So now we focus on the idea of the economics uh, as being performative, right? Uh, so economics is performative. And that's the second concept that we are dealing with, ladies and gentlemen. So when we say that economics is performative, right? Uh, we actually mean that economics shapes the social world, uh, which implies that the world does not exist economics independently after all. So there is a sense in which many things in society depend on science for their existence. And indeed, our social institutions and practices, uh, beliefs and norms are deeply shaped by the products of science right from physics and biochemistry, epidemiology, psychology, etc. Now, evidently, economics can be added to this list because economics is very, very important. So there is a connection between the science of economics and the economic world that flows from the former to the latter, ladies and gentlemen. So economic theories and research results somehow directly shape people's beliefs and worldviews in ways that are relevant to their economic behavior. So when we talk about the reality that exists out there, there are many worldviews, right? Remember, you can have that objective perspective that reality exists out there, and therefore we can actually construct that reality objectively and there are those who think that, um, uh, well, uh, this reality that you, you are talking about is subjective and therefore very difficult to construct. But there are those who also believe that reality is socially constructed because you never do away with the individuals or human beings that are connected in a series of networks and then you have a number of social activities being performed in that perspective. So when we are talking about uh, economics, ladies and gentlemen, research in economics, theories in economics, models in economics are very important because the results we get from them, they do shape the beliefs of people and then the world views in ways that are very relevant to the economic behaviors. Therefore, policy advice are based on economic theories and research results. Uh, will shape economic policies and these in turn uh, will shape the economy when we start talking about the economy. So there is no doubt that the economy is dependent on economics. So you'll never talk about the economy without economics, right? And uh, they are very uh, much linked. But of course, uh, as I said earlier on, the issue of economics is uh, quite often uh, forgotten in the modeling of economics. And that's why uh, some of the models do not even uh, possibly work well. So one might conclude that the idea of science does not serve scientific realism at all uh, well in the case of economics. Uh, but. To examine the issue, it will be useful for us uh, in this lecture, ladies and gentlemen, to look more closely at the thesis of performativity. 
So we are examining the thesis of performativity that was put forward by Mackenzie 2006. So uh, Mackenzie certainly uh, says that uh, economics performs facts in the economy. So when we talk about the thesis of performativity, we are promoting the idea that economics performs the facts in the economy, and that is Mackenzie 2006. And in order to examine this performativity thesis, ladies and gentlemen, it will be useful to begin with a brief look at the original idea, ladies and gentlemen. The original idea comes to the fore in 1962 with the works of Austin. And that's one of the reference books that I gave you, that I asked you, that I've asked you to read. Read Austin's works, 1962, who talks, who gives an account of performativity. Now, Austin says, one performs an action by uttering some string of words, and he calls that a performative sentence. Right? That when you make a statement, and you, and you say that we shall buy masks for every Ugandan, yes, you have made an utterance. That's an utterance, right? Made by you. So you utter a string of words, and that is a performative sentence. So I can give another example. If I say, I promise to deliver the paper by the deadline, I am therefore promising to deliver the paper by the deadline. To utter a performative sentence is not, is not, ladies and gentlemen, to describe a pre-existing action. And in this case, when we talk about a pre-existing action, that is promising. So in, uh, when we talk about performance, performative sentence, you must be capable of performing that action. So saying so makes it, therefore performance becomes very important. The connection between speaking words and doing things is one of constitution rather than causation. Saying I apologize constitutes the act of apologizing. Saying I agree constitutes the act of agreeing. So those utterings do not cause those acts. Rather, those acts are constituted by those utterings. So to utter those sentences is to take those actions, ladies and gentlemen. So this authentic meaning of performativity has been obscured by recent literature on how economic theory can have consequences for economic reality. So when we say we are going to do something in economics, we must be able to do it, but not mere utterances, although we have uh, uh, performative utterances in sentences. So in economics, ladies and gentlemen, three meanings of performativity are derived. And the first one is what you call the generic performativity. The second one is what we call effective performativity. And the third one is what you call Banesian performativity. So now, the generic performativity refers to an economic model which is performed in the sense of being used by economic agents. And that's generic performativity. We model in economics. Now, this economic model, right, that is performed, right, is performed in the sense of being used by economic agents. So you've got practitioners. So when you collect data, first of all, when you uh, model, you collect data, right, and then you test. In other words, you should be able to pass on this model uh, onto uh, economic agents 
to implement. And this is generic performativity. The second one is what you call the effective uh, performativity, uh, meaning that the use right, of the model creates a difference. So its use has a consequence. It makes a difference. Right, and that's what we call the effective performativity. So, first of all, you have a model that you have designed and you give it to economic agents to use. That's a generic. After that, that model is used by those fellows, but is effective. In other words, it has the consequences. It makes a difference. The third is what we call the Banesian performativity. Meaning that the use of that model that you've come up with makes the model more true. So in other words, we, it, it, it captures reality out there perfectly well and explains that reality. And that's what we call the Banesian performativity, ladies and gentlemen. So what is important uh, in economics, ladies and gentlemen, is the connection between economics and the economy. And that connection between economics and the economy is supposed to be implemented by the use of economics uh, and uh, by those economic actors, ladies and gentlemen. So using an economic model goes well beyond just recognizing it uh, uttered or written down in the various journal articles and the various uh, discussion uh, papers and so forth, but you are able to use that model. Uh, so use involves taking further action of these models, ladies and gentlemen. So this undermines the idea that uh, uh, the idea that saying so non-causally makes it so, ladies and gentlemen. So. The social world as we know it contains both causal and constitutive relationships and realism is comfortable with both uh, simply because they are part of social reality, ladies and gentlemen. So naturally, economic theorizing can have consequences for the economy, but these consequences flow through indirect causal rather than direct constitutive uh, connections and relationships. And the popular phrase used is that the economy is shaped by economics, and literally speaking, economic theories do not shape the economy, nor does economic inquiry, but people do. So in their various roles as policy makers, students, investors, entrepreneurs, etc., people are exposed to the results of economic inquiry, and they learn directly or indirectly about the contents of economic theories. They learn about the explanations and uh, predictions, and they are inspired by them, perhaps by being persuaded by the proponents of those theories and models, so as to modify their beliefs and perhaps their motives. So these modified beliefs and motives make a difference for their behavior, and this has consequences for the economy. So the flow of this connection is a matter of causal inference rather than direct constitution, ladies and gentlemen. So hence the admission that some economic facts can be uh, causally, uh, can be causally economics dependent. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. So it's very important for us to understand uh, this aspect of performativity. And that's why we had to discuss this element, ladies and gentlemen. So allow me uh, to move to the conclusion uh, so that we conclude this discussion, ladies and gentlemen. So in conclusion, I want to say that our discussion has attempted to give flavor uh, of the sorts of uh, special issues that need to be addressed uh, in the case of economics. Uh, and uh, these aspects that have to be addressed uh, in economics, they have to be addressed by general philosophers of science who are interested in scientific realism. And they also have to look at the element of performativity uh, of economics and uh, then find out how that element of performativity is related to the economy 
and economic actors, ladies and gentlemen. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for attending this lecture 10. And uh, this has brought us to the end uh, of uh, this topic that we call realism and anti-realism uh, about economics. And uh, we've looked at, I gave you the introduction, we've looked, we've looked at the scientific realism uh, in conventional uh, philosophy of science. We've looked at ingredients of minimal scientific realism. We've gone to the common sensibles and their modifications in the economic modeling. Uh, and in this perspective, looked at the isolation by idealization, Friedman, 1953, SE, uh, the ontology versus methodology, modeling invisible hand mechanism, and it specifically and particularly in this lecture, we have closed that topic by looking at the social construction of reality. And the social construction, two aspects have been discussed, rhetorical construction of the world and truth and performativity and the economics dependence of the economy. I want to thank you for attending and uh, wish you a nice time. I can only say stay well, stay safe. Let us meet again in our lecture 11 as we take on a new topic. Thank you very much. Bye.